a year ago, we did not have vaccinations implemented in very many people. I mean, just relatively few people. Right now, we have vaccinations and boosters available to people. We are quite clearly, and we have to admit it, being challenged by various surges of different variants. We just recently got through the Delta surge and now we're faced with an Omicron surge. In the United States, the numbers are really concerning. We're averaging over 2,000 deaths per day. We have about 156,000 people in the hospital. Uh, and the cases are averaging between 600,000 and 700,000 a day. That's, that's the tough news, the bad news. The somewhat encouraging news is that in many regions of the country, the outbreak has peaked and is turning around. We're seeing that explicitly and specifically in the northeastern part of the country as exemplified by New York City and in the upper Midwest in Chicago, also as far south as Washington, DC. However, there are some states, southern states and western states which are still surging, and some of them are starting to level off. I think the net effect is that you're gonna see a peak and then an ultimate diminution of number of cases, and ultimately as a late indicator, numbers of hospitalization. But we, we can't be overconfident that because this looks like it's turning around, that we're out of the woods. One of the things that we've gotta to continue to try and do is to get people vaccinated because the data are extraordinarily clear. When you look at the number of hospitalizations and the severity of disease and compare unvaccinated people with vaccinated people, the difference is striking. I mean, very, very uh, profoundly evident the difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated. So it's a mixed bag. Um, we do well if we're vaccinated and boosted, but we only have about 63% of the population is fully vaccinated, which means that 37% are not. So when the president says we're much better off, he's really referring to the fact that what we have now, we didn't have a year ago. We didn't have the vaccine implementation plan we have. We didn't have antivirals that were effective and we have at least five now. We didn't have a lot of masks available. We now have hundreds of millions of masks, and we are now implementing about a half a billion rapid tests in the next month or so, followed by yet again another half a billion tests. So if you look at across the terrain of what's available for the American public in the form of vaccines, boosters, masks, tests, antiviral therapy, we're much, much better off than we were a year ago. I can always count on you for such a wonderful summation of everything. I'm going to have you move outside of the U.S., not literally, but uh, in this in this line of uh, questioning, to talk about vaccine donations and why, in in summary, it's so important in your view as a health professional that we're donating so many vaccines to other countries. Oh, it's absolutely critical. You address a global outbreak by a global solution and a global effort. And that's the why the United States has been committed to and will deliver on vaccine doses to low and middle income countries. So let's look at what's been done thus far. Over 400 million doses of vaccine have been given to over 115 countries. The United States has given or pledged 1.1 billion doses to be delivered between now and the middle of this year as we get into the fall. We've given or pledged $4 billion for COVAX, and we are now working with the companies to expand the capability of the companies such as Moderna and Pfizer and others to be able to ramp up their production to make doses available more quickly to the low and middle income countries. So the United States is leading the world in that by far. I wanna ask you about some of the stickier issues there. For example, the TRIPS waiver, waiving vaccines patent, it's nowhere near getting US support. Do you think that's a part of the puzzle? I don't think that that's really necessarily a part of the puzzle because it's very clear that we can get doses that are manufactured 
in the plants that are already going full blast to the low and middle income countries. I mean, obviously, several of the country companies, even Moderna, have said that they would not create or any issue with patent involvement if other countries are able to essentially produce the vaccine. So I don't think that that is an issue. I mean, obviously, you want to make sure that you have everything you do to make doses available for the developing world. But I think we can do that on the basis of what's going on right now. I want to ask you about this proposal from House and Senate Democrats for $17 billion in additional funding for global vaccination efforts. Do you think that's enough? Do you think that that's appropriate? What do you think? No, I'm not going to comment on legislation. That's not appropriate for me to be commenting on pending legislation. I want to then talk to you about the fact that now in the U.S. it's considered normal to have three shots, a booster. And do you think that the U.S. needs to change its vaccine donation efforts in light of that? The three shots is now considered to be the norm, especially with the highly contagious Omicron variant. No, I think the donation effort is really substantial and will get better and better. And I think ultimately that will accommodate the need for boosters. But let's take one step at a time, a very small percentage of some of the countries, particularly in Southern Africa, are fully vaccinated. Let's get that first and then we'll worry about the boosters. But we do appreciate the need ultimately throughout the world to get people optimally protected. And we know that optimal protection with an mRNA means a third shot and with J&J means a second shot. Let me ask you just about what's happening at the U.S. border. Do you think it's still appropriate for Article, I believe it's called Article 42, to be in place? And um, just relatedly, do you think that there should be more vaccine donations to Central American countries? You know, I got to tell you, that's not the area that I get involved with, so I don't really feel I should comment on that. Totally fair. I want to ask you something else, because the last time we spoke was about AIDS. This was before COVID was even on the horizon. And I know that this is this is the, the pandemic that you started with. I want to ask you about the lessons that you think we should have learned from the AIDS pandemic that we haven't learned that we should be applying to the COVID pandemic. Well, I think there's been a lot of back and forth uh, uh, between COVID and HIV, things that we've learned from HIV to apply to COVID and things that we've learned with COVID that will go back and help us with HIV, the latter of which is the vaccine capability that was developed with new platforms and immunogen design that have led to such successful vaccines with COVID-19. We're gonna go back now and apply some of those technologies to HIV, which as you know, we've not been successful in developing vaccines for HIV. So that's going from COVID to HIV. From HIV to COVID, I think it's important to make sure you engage the community, um, particularly with regard to the disparities in health. One of the things that have been really problematic in our own country is that African-Americans and Hispanics have a higher degree of likelihood of getting infected When they do get infected, they have a higher likelihood of a severe outcome. And that is because of some of the underlying comorbidities that are much more prevalent in the African-American and Hispanic population, such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension, kidney disease, chronic lung disease. So the lessons we've learned from both HIV, in which there have clearly been health disparities, and COVID-19 is that maybe we should use this to remind us why we have a responsibility to address the social determinants of health that allow a black and brown person to be much more likely to get a severe outcome from an infection that should essentially impact people equally. And it doesn't. It's always something that's more severe for brown and black people. And that has to do with a very complicated issue of social determinants of health that go back decades, if not centuries in this country, dating back to the inherent racism that we see in so many elements of our society.